afternoon. Yes, it's, it's, it's not, yeah, it will be this afternoon in 10 minutes time. Uh, my title is uh, To the Jew First. So I'm reading from uh, verse, verse 8 of Romans chapter 1. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by, by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I've had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Quoting Habakkuk there, I think. Praise the Lord to the Jew first. Um, and I would subtitle this, true freedom, true freedom for God's chosen people can only come from the gospel. When we marked the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz earlier this year, I felt it was a good time to ponder the spiritual liberation that will truly set God's chosen people free. And it's worth recalling that it wasn't Moses who set them free from slavery in Egypt, but the blood of a lamb. The merciless slaughter of six million Jews by one of the most advanced so-called civilized nations on earth should remind us of the depth of depravity which man is capable. Any thoughts of his inherent goodness are surely shattered by the Nazis' ethnic cleansing that wiped out a third of worldwide Jewry. The truth is that man is born with a corrupt, sinful nature, which can only be rectified by the gospel. The sacrifice for sin of the Jewish Messiah that restores our relationship with the living God. With this in mind, the terrible tragedy of the Holocaust is exacerbated by the negative effect it has had on Jewish evangelism. Christians, for the most part, have put Jewish mission on the back burner or ditched it altogether. Because the common perception among many Jews today is still that they were sent to the gas chambers by Christian nations, and there is undoubtedly some truth in this. It has understandably hardened their hearts against the message of hope that they so desperately need. At the same time, the church at large has backed off regarding Jewish mission as a no-go area, whether out of guilt, wrong theology, or a misunderstanding of history. Some believe Jews forfeited their right as God's chosen people by their national rejection of Jesus and have thus been replaced by the church. Others believe Jews have their own covenant through which a right standing with God can be obtained. But the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. It is for everyone, but to the Jew first. Denying the gospel to the Jews is an abrogation of our priority in evangelism and the height of anti-Semitism, because we are thus withholding the liberating message of their own Messiah from the very people for whom he came. Ensuring that the Shoah, as, it's also, as the Holocaust is also called, is never repeated, is a noble pursuit. But our desire for the salvation of the Jews should be paramount. 
as it was for the Apostle Paul, who wrote, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. The salvation that cost our Lord so much was first and foremost for those of his own flesh. Yet in many churches, it is hard to find any evidence for such mission. A lesson from history. More recent history. Christian mission to the Jews was hugely successful in both the 19th and early 20th centuries. I bet not too many people know that. Records show that over 200,000 Jews became believers in Yeshua during the 19th century with various, well, various Jewish missions, including CMJ, for whom I volunteer, that's the church's mission among Jewish people. CMJ's extensive branches all over Europe reported that as many as 229,000 Jews, that's all the missions, not just CMJ's uh, uh, figures, had become followers of Jesus by the outbreak of World War I in 1939. That's approaching quarter of a million Jews who were alive at that time who were following Jesus. That's quite a lot, isn't it? You know, because uh, <clears throat> it's almost as many people as live in this, this large town we live in here in Doncaster. Many of the latter would have perished in the concentration camps though surely not without sharing the comfort of Messiah with their fellow sufferers. And there's, there's still, uh, there's still uh, in research going on as to exactly who they were and how many there were. It is not really known. Such a spiritual harvest was a direct result of the great evangelical awakening, heralded by John Wesley and carried into the 19th century by the likes of Charles Spurgeon, Bishop J.C. Ryle and Charles Simeon, all of whom made much of the vital need for Jewish evangelism in particular, and for blessing the Jews in general. This in turn had the world-changing knock-on effect of supporting Zionist aspirations, which led to the British government's Balfour Declaration of 1917, and ultimately to the rebirth of Israel as a nation in their ancient land helped of course no end by the 1920 San Remo Treaty to which we referred to earlier, which really confirmed the Balfour Declaration. Yet despite the slackening of evangelical focus on God's chosen people, along with the emotional obstacles of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust to which I have referred, we are now witnessing a messianic movement that is Jewish disciples of Jesus making an impact out of all proportion to its still relatively no, relative, relatively low numbers. As one of them told our 2017 tour group in Galilee, 90% of Jewish believers come to faith through the witness of Gentiles. So imagine what a harvest we could reap if we were all pulling our weight. Writing of the reasons why big corporations are so keen to invest in the Jewish state. Israel Today editor-in-chief Aviel Schneider says, due to the long, the long history of exile and dispersion, the Jew in general, and the Israeli in particular, often has close ties to family and friends all over the globe. This makes Israelis some of the best advocates in the world if you can convince them of the merits of your product. And he adds, 2,000 years ago, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, similarly spread from Israel. It seems that the best way of spreading the gospel around the world is to make the Jews our priority. That's certainly how it all began with, G with Jesus teaching the first believers, virtually all of whom were Jews, with such dramatic results. The Apostle Paul though called primarily to the Gentiles, practiced what he preached by first sharing the gospel message with the Jews in the various synagogues of his missionary journeys, including Cyprus, Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and Corinth. 
synagogue first. He wasn't always well received, but it's interesting to note that in Berea, where the Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, <clears throat> in that they received the message with great eagerness and, and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true, there would seem to have been a rich harvest among both Jews and Gentiles in Berea. Interesting. Would our gospel harvest be greater if we once more practiced Jewish mission as a priority? Well, that's a challenge <laughs> for us all. Cambridge-based Reverend Charles Simeon, one of the leading evangelical figures of the 19th century, certainly believed so. The story goes that while preaching passionately of the Jews' future spiritual restoration, ushering in a worldwide revival, he was passed a note by a friend stating, six million Jews and 600 million Gentiles, which is more important? Now, this was a reference to Jews representing 1% of the world's population at the time. <clears throat> the figure today is 0.1% percentage-wise, so that's only 10% of what it used to be. 0.1% of the world's population. Yet, the Lord is saying, you go to them first. Simeon, Simeon presumably a very quick-thinking, clever man, <laughs> he apparently scribbled back. If the conversion of the six is to be life from the dead, uh, life from the dead for, of the 600, what then? He was referring to Romans 11, verse 15, where Paul asks, if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? The Jews were the key, he was saying. The gospel is for the Jew first. You see, we try and work things out in our head in a very sort of Greek way, rather than in the in the way that the um, the the Jews think. You know, well, we go to the we'll, we'll go over whether the most people, <laughs> but the Lord says, go to the Jew first. It's also a more powerful way of presenting the gospel, even to Gentiles. My wife Linda my great assistant in the in technical realm this morning <laughs> she frequently teaches on the jewish feasts as well as christianity <clears throat> in the primary schools of doncaster quite a, quite apart from its its use in fulfilling curriculum requirements for understanding judaism it serves as a perfect opportunity for explaining how jesus fulfilled the feasts recently after she, after she'd gone out to teach on passover at one of the schools i went out to get my hair cut now so you can imagine this was it was just before lockdown actually that's the last official haircut i've had so as linda was teaching the eager children i was engaging with two lady hairdressers what do you believe all about passover somehow we got onto the subject of what linda was doing you know how the hairdressers are very chatty and uh i have never felt such freedom in proclaiming the gospel it was as if they couldn't get enough of it and they asked many questions about zionism israel's amazing technological achievements and much more i must explain that that it was a quiet period um hence the second hairdresser joining in the discussion and of course it was before lockdown just before lockdown it made me realize that we have been missing something in the church the gospel is better introduced by an explanation of what happened at passover i could see how it was all clicking into place for those two lovely ladies they obviously wanted to go deeper so i came back later with signed copies of my book a nation reborn this was before king of the jews came out by the way <laughs> this is my previous book a nation reborn if you want it it's a good read <laughs> romans 1 verse 16 is really an extension of one of the most fundamental truths in all the bible that if you bless the seed of abraham you will be blessed but if you curse them you will come under judgment genesis 12 3 <clears throat> 
And there is no better way of blessing anyone than sharing the gospel with them. Besides, we owe it to them. As Paul also tells the Romans, though in the context of offering material help because we have shared in their spiritual blessings. See Romans chapter 15, verse 27. For they gave us the, patri the patriarchs, the prophets, the scriptures, and Jesus himself. We certainly owe it to the Jewish people to share the gospel and to share our material blessings if the Lord puts that on our hearts. In this respect, it's important to emphasize that there is not a dichotomy between the spiritual and political with regard to Israel. That's why we so often mix it up, and I, I certainly mix it up in, in, in my writings. I don't, I don't find, well, one week I'll write about the political aspects and another, re, uh, another a week about the spiritual aspects. It's all tied in together. Um, uh, it's not the separation from sacred and secular that is, again, very much a Greek way of thinking that has come very much into the church, and which is a real problem uh, today. No, they, the spiritual and political are intertwined with each other. They have inherited both a land and everlasting love from the Lord. Why all the fuss over Israel? Some Christians ask. They are not following God and don't deserve our concern, they argue. But would you say that about a lost man who needs Jesus? Of course not. His body needs the life-giving spirit from heaven, and we Gentiles are called to share the gospel with the Jews as of first importance. Yes, Jesus came for both Jew and Gentile, but he has a special interest in the restoration, both physically and spiritually, of Israel. He is looking to that time when the body and spirit come together as one, as it were. As individuals, we are born of the flesh, then of the spirit, as um, Jesus taught Nicodemus, John 3, verse 3. As a nation, Israel is restored to their land and will then recognize Messiah and follow him. Ezekiel puts it, for I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36. As with the confession of Nathaniel at the start of Messiah's ministry, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. The second coming of Jesus also has a significance of both heaven son of God, and earth, king of Israel, See the heavenly aspect and the earthly aspect. So why was it that the secular media, particularly the BBC, gave excellent and widespread coverage to the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, while there was a deafening silence from the church in general? Apart from the Christians of High Wycombe, who publicly confessed their mistreatment of Jews over the centuries, why does it take parachurch organizations like Christian Friends of Israel to stand up for the truth? And why were Christians not dancing in the streets following last December's election? Not over Brexit, but because we had somewhat miraculously been spared a Jew-hating Marxist regime. Just as the Jews celebrated with joy and gladness following their deliverance through Esther in 400 BC. If we Christians are not standing up for the Jews, there is something seriously wrong with our theology. Now let me share you an up-to-date testimony with you. David, I don't know his second name, David, from, he's from an Orthodox Jewish background. He has taken to the streets of Tel Aviv to share the message that dramatically changed his life. And it was a forbidden book, as he calls it that brought the peace and happiness that had long did, that had long eluded him. The forbidden book of the New Testament. <laughs> he was living the high life in America after serving in a combat unit with the Israeli Defense Force for three years 
and was making good money selling Dead Sea products, while at the same time indulging in what he called all the pleasures the world had to offer. But it didn't lead to real happiness. He knew there must be something deeper to life. Then a Jewish customer asked him, have you ever felt God in your life? It caused him to wonder if this was possible. So he started reading the Bible. When he read in Psalm 22, the phrase, they have pierced my hands and my feet, verse 16, he wondered if it was referring to Jesus on the cross, which worried him because rabbis generally use the derogatory name Yeshu, the Notsri, that is Jesus the Nazarene, with reference to Jesus. So he did what any good Jewish boy would do. He called his mom, who scolded him, saying, that's a Gentile book. We are forbidden to read it. She thought he was reading from the New Testament, but in fact, it was from the Old. It was from the Psalms, wasn't it? It was from the Hebrew Bible. David's search continued until one day he came across a painting of Abraham offering Isaac as a sacrifice to God. Well, immediately above it, there was a picture of Jesus on the cross, God offering his son as a sacrifice for us. He got the connection and decided to follow Jesus, Yeshua, who he soon realized was not only Messiah, but also God. The discovery triggered by the verse attributed to God in Isaiah 44, verse 6, to which we referred earlier, I am the first and the last which is repeated, in, uh, repeated by Jesus in Revelation 1, verse 17. Unfortunately, all this coincided with tragedies in his family, and it was suggested that his new life may have contributed to their troubles. In any case, they felt he had betrayed his people. But in time, his parents noticed how much he had changed. I was a typical Israeli punk, he said. You name it, I smoked it. <laughs> With a warm but explosive temperament, apparently common to those of Moroccan background, he was also tainted by swearing, pride, and impatience, and had been addicted to smoking and drugs. Suddenly, I wasn't doing any of that, he said, and it didn't take long for my family to realize that these changes were, were not down to Yeshu the, Not the Notsri, but Yeshua the Jew. He came for all of us, David said, first for the Jews and then for the rest of the world. It's just that we, the Jewish nation, rejected him when he came, just as we rejected many other prophets God sent. But there was always a remnant among those, among the Jews who believed. Yeshua was what I was missing my whole life. His peace changed my heart and transformed me for good. The more I learned, the more Yeshua won my heart, and I just fell in love with him. Now I feel called to bring the message of the Jewish Messiah to the people of Israel. He's part of a congregation now in Tel Aviv and witnessing on the streets uh, to Jews, as many people in Tel Aviv are doing, and many people in, in Jerusalem are doing as well, and in Haifa, um, the evangelists, Jewish evangelists are going at it hammer and tongs in, in, in the land. We don't hear much about, about it, but they, when they get hold of the gospel, they really get going. Hmm. So, though only part Jewish, I feel that's my calling too. I guess in my early days as a Christian, I didn't fully grasp Paul's statement that the gospel was to the Jew first. And so ended up proclaiming the gospel the wrong way around so to speak, by which I mean to the Gentile first. Back in the early 1980s, I started an evangelistic newspaper called The New Life, which is still circulating in this country. And it was as I was seeking the Lord for direction on how to go about it, and whether I should, that I took a walk along the beautiful hills northwest of Sheffield, where we lived, on the edge of the uh, Peak District National Park. And the Lord spoke to me very powerfully, confirming the rightness of going ahead with the publication. 
As, as I got to the summit of a particular hill, I was taken aback by the stunning view before me, and I heard the Lord clearly say, how beautiful. So I'm getting all emotional. <laughs> Forgive me. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. That's what I heard the Lord say to me. And I was looking at this beautiful view. Feet, foot fitted with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Taking that from Ephesians chapter 6. Are beautiful in God's sight. The Lord was looking at my feet. I was looking at the view. He says, you get on, you get on and do that. <laughs> and so it proved. Many people, especially, many people, especially in, in that very locality, came to the Lord through that paper, which continues to circulate, as I said, around the UK. But it was only much more recently that I realized the context of that particular passage from Isaiah was about those who bring good news to Zion, to the Jewish people, telling them, your God reigns. I mean, yes, the Lord understood that I didn't quite get it. Uh, and he was happy for me to preach to the Gentiles first. Okay. But in the context, Isaiah 52, that passage is about bringing good news to Zion, to the Jewish people, telling them, your God reigns. And we love him. <laughs> I had the tremendous privilege of doing just that on my second visit to Israel in 2014. When I, uh, <clears throat> I was actually, I went there to cover a conference, uh, uh, an amazing conference uh, in, in which Arab and Jew come together. Uh, um, Arab and Jew believing pastors actually um, come together to encourage one another in, in Yeshua. Uh, at the, the Christ Church in Jerusalem, the headquarters of the church's uh, ministry among Jewish people. It's a conference held every two years. Um, <clears throat> Arab uh, pastors come from all over the Middle East, some countries that are supposed to be enemies of, of Israel, and, and they, they share with one another, and there's wonderful embracing of the one new man, of Jew and Gentile, and Jew and Arab, embracing one another it's an amazing thing and i have written about that as well you can get it on the at, from eden books and elsewhere it's called peace in jerusalem so <clears throat> as i say uh, that's why i went to um, israel in 2014 was to cover that conference and to write about it uh, <clears throat> and then i i, I was um, on my way to the flat i was staying with, with um, with friends in uh, in Jerusalem, um, and I got a bit thirsty. Uh, it's been a long night, so I, I called in at, at uh, Mike's place uh, on the Jaffa Road. It was, like, it was like a sort of bar, stroke nightclub. Um, I called in a, a, for a drink. Anyway, I got talking to the chap behind the bar and some an Irishman and some Jewish young young people. Uh, very open to the Lord. The Irishman wasn't actually, this is nothing against you Irishman, I've got Irish ancestry as well, so don't worry. Um, but he wasn't <laughs> at all open, but the Jewish, the Jewish young men were open to the Lord. And uh, the barman eventually sort of said to me, I don't know how this came up, he said, we have an open mic uh, evening tomorrow. I uh, can't remember which day it was. They actually have live music, uh, people doing live music every single day. But on one of the days, it was an open mic meeting. So he, he says, well, why don't you come join? I said, well, he said, I'd like to do that, but uh, I don't have a guitar. Anyway, he said, you can borrow mine. Anyway, he lent me his guitar, beautiful guitar, I might say. So, uh, I, so I came the next day and I, I do a bit of singing with a family and things, but I've never done an open mic before. <laughs> so uh, I came in and I sang a couple of songs in front of a, a room full of 20 somethings, starting with a love song to my gorgeous wife at home. <laughs> An Elvis number called Can't Help Falling in Love. You might remember, I'm sure you'll remember that one. Knowing looks. <laughs> Wise men say, only fools rush in. Anyway, I'll sing that. And uh, they liked it. So I followed it up with You Raise Me Up. Uh, which is a bit more spiritual, even though I see it as a worship song, really, although it doesn't mention God by, 
God by name. A bit like uh, some books in the Bible, such as, um, such as Esther, I suppose. When I returned to my seat, a young Jewish man thanked me for my songs and asked, or rather declared, you were singing about Jesus, weren't you? And that sparked a long conversation about why I follow the Jewish Messiah and why there was nothing to stop him doing the same. As it happens, his name was Musha, Musha, translated Moses in English. I explained how just as his ancestors were freed from slavery in Egypt by the blood of the lamb, daubed on the lintels and doorposts of their houses. So the blood of Jesus gives us true freedom when we mark it on our hearts, as it were, in acknowledgement of our trust in its saving power. It was an awesome privilege to share how Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of Passover with a modern Moses. And I pray, and I still pray for Moshe, uh, when I think about that. So if you wish to make an impact on our troubled world, preach the gospel to the Jew first, if you can. <laughs>